from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Uh, my name is David Plyler. I'm with the Music Division. And I'm going to be speaking today about some very special pieces from late list, um, the historical Hungarian poets. I'm sorry, historical Hungarian portraits, which involves some poetry, so that's maybe cause of that slip there. Um, it's also knows, known as the Historische Ungarische Bildnisse. Um, these pieces were not published during List's lifetime. In fact, they were not published at all until uh, 1956 and then 57 and 58, um, other parts of it came to, came to be. The Library of Congress has five source sets of source materials for these pieces. And uh, they reside in the Rosenthal collection and in the Waters collection. Um, it's interesting because the uh, creators of the new List edition from uh, Musica Budapest listed as a secondary source, but there seems to be quite a bit of primary source material located in these items. And I'll, uh, after this talk, I'll show you some of those items if you'd like up here on the stage. I pulled them out for you. The idea behind these pieces is something of a memorial to uh, major uh, Hungarian uh, figures, both political and uh, writers uh, and musicians. And uh, I'd like to read from uh, somebody who uh, sums it up well and also plays a pivotal role in the order in which I put these pieces, uh, named uh, Legani. He writes, the character of Sashenyi, who is the first piece, is proud and determined, unyielding, adamantly persevering, consummating, making its way firmly higher and higher. You'll actually hear this in the music. It is here that the cycle becomes more tense. Deok, which he places as the second piece, reflects a basically sunny personality who brings about with great creative force a reconciled world around him. Um, in parentheses, how many yarns he had once spun with how many cheering turns to them. And by this, he wins his victory. The piece contains no tone of funeral music at all, and it is here that the cycle is given some relief. So there's tension, relief. The tragic fate of Teleki, who he's placing as the third piece, um, is an absolutely gripping dead march above the booming of bells in the basso ostinato, uh, which we'll talk about. It presents the utmost dramatic contrast after the serenity of the Dayak movement. Yotvosh, the movement that follows Teleki, pays respect to the man of dynamism and its prelude and postlude, and within this framework, List recalls him in nostalgic, nocturne sentiments that lack any funereal flavor. This is again followed by an increase of tension in the cycle, Furushmarti, and that opens with lonesome leaves of fourths and fifths, and we'll talk about that as well, uh, pointing afar and replete with pain, uh, before the appearance of a reference to the poet in the melody of two lines of his sotsat above the tolling of the F-sharp ostinato in the bass. Um, the words being quoted there is, the wide world holds for you no other place than this. Um, it ends with a stirring but increasingly clouded clo closing session. Um, I'll skip ahead. Um, if Furushmati is replete with tension, Petufi brings relief, but in a highly complex way. Instead of being a character sketch of the poet's personality, it is an image developed by List himself of the poet who died so young on the battlefield, leaving no trace. Perhaps for this reason is the portrait in the cycle with the most facets, solitary in the prelude, elegiac in the principal section that unfolds out of this solitude, consoled in the trio, passionate in the varied recapitulation of the principal section, and petering out into the distance in the postlude. The last movement brings profound and mournful grief, and again, this is not a likeness of Moshonyi, but the memory of him, as in the case of Petofi's portrait. 
So that's kind of a, a nutshell of the types of elegies that are found in this collection of seven works. Um, but what that doesn't necessarily get across is the, uh, the depth, as is typical of late list, um, that he puts into uh, each particular piece, not necessarily aligning very firmly with a particular character trait that uh, one by now might have forgotten, um, but rather something of substance itself within each piece. Um, and then he also constructs uh, something much more um, kind of convoluted across all seven pieces. Um, and this is one of the reasons that we're looking at, at these pieces in this particular order. Um, I'm going to play these pieces, but I'm going to explain a little bit about each one before I do um, in a new order, rather one that was proposed in 1986 or so by Legani. And the reason that they, they're brought about, uh, why they were published in the first place in the wrong order, is that they were in the possession of August Gullerich, who was a, a student of Liszt's, and who was one of the um, people whose uh, notes we used about the master classes at the end of Liszt's life to learn a bit about what he was doing and what he was up to. Um, but in any case, uh, they weren't published for a long time. Eventually, the order just got jumbled. But there is some evidence in Liszt's letters that he had a very specific order in mind. And I, in fact, even think that, that there's a particular piece that sets the precedent for the work as a whole in terms of uh, how particular motives are going to be used. And I'll mention that when we get to that piece. Five of the works were composed in 1885. Um, two of them are slight adaptations slash recompositions of two earlier pieces, one from 1870-ish, 1871, um, called uh, Moshoni's Grabgeleit, which is the funeral procession of the composer Moshoni, who I'll speak a little bit more about soon. And the other one is based on, it originally had the name Dim Ongdenken Petufi, and that was uh, basically a, to the memory of Petufi, who was this uh, major uh, poet who died uh, in 1849 and you'll notice that a lot of these people were part of this uh, revolutionary struggle in Hungary and of particular importance uh, in the revolutionary years and also um, post in trying to produce a government and preserve Hungarian culture and things like that. So the, every single one of these people, though, um, is dead by the time that List writes these pieces. So they are memorial works. I'm going to not get up and down so much because of a little bit of a back problem, so I'm going to speak for the remainder from there, if you don't mind, uh, whilst also looking at a few of these pieces more in more detail. So the first piece that we're going to look at um, is called Stefan Sesheni. Um, and Sesheni was uh, a major politician and writer um, who was very uh, important to everybody and had a, had a very uh, significant impact in particular on Moshoni, which we'll get to later, um, because of his suicide in 1860. Um, it basically caused uh, a day of mourning in Hungary and uh, uh, Moshoni responded with a very intense um, funeral work that actually uh, ended up catapulting him to fame in a, a sense. Um, and we'll speak about that in a minute because that, act, that piece actually relates very directly to a different one of the um, Hungarians that we're going to be looking at. Um, one of the, the things, though, that I want to focus on is not so much Hungarian history and Liszt's ability to capture that or capture a character in a particularly uh, um, concise way, even though that is a part of what these pieces are, um, but rather, I want to show some of their shared components and also some of the alternative versions that exist in the Library of Congress uh, manuscripts that we have. And I'll explain uh, why some of these, I think, should actually be considered to be the primary versions of the piece. Um, I can't know for sure. The, the version that was used uh, to produce the 
the uh, main published edition uh, is lost, so we don't have access to that manuscript material, but at least we do have um, some very compelling evidence in our own collection, which I think is exciting to look at and always makes for an interesting you know, look at these pieces. Um, so as an example, I'm going to play how List uh, originally had this in the copyist manuscript. Um, he has this tendency to use uh, uh, expository second statements of an of a idea. So he'll put out one idea, repeat it, then do another idea and repeat it. This is how it was originally. You can hear how those things are just, it's just a repeated idea. Um, we have list corrections in between the staves, so you can see where he crosses out that secondary idea. He crosses that out and instead gives us this. That particular idea um, is an important one across the set as well. Um, and I think that that's uh, something that I'll get to in a minute about the types of motives that you'll find in this whole work. Um, I do want to say that also what we find in this original copyist manuscript is a simplified version of the piece. So we'll have uh, an idea. I'll play how, the, how it was originally written and then how List amended it. So he basically creates a, a little bit of rhythmic complexity, um, and that comes into place uh, into play every time that we hear this uh, material in a different way, and it actually serves to propel the music forward in an interesting way. Um, with respect to certain ideas that I'm uh, going to just bring up now that you're going to hear over and over again in this entire set and what makes the argument for considering it a cycle to be a compelling one um, are what, I, what I'm calling Fifths and sixths, they've been recognized as having the following fifth motive, um, but sixths play just as important a role, both melodically and harmonically. Um, we'll see them mostly harmonically here, or sorry, melodically here. Um, but then the other thing to notice is that this is all very barren, octave-laden writing. It's very exposed. Um, that in itself is kind of a motivic idea. Um, then we have certain types of scales that keep coming back in a particular way. Um, I won't go over those right now, but you'll, you'll hear them very clearly. Um, and also a compelling thing to think about is that these fifth ideas and sixth ideas were added after the copyist version that we have. So originally, it would have, I'll play what it would have sounded like uh, going into without the fifths included, and then I'll play just a little bit of what it sounds like with the fifths. That's the uh, Faust chord, I mean the Tristan chord. Um, sorry, there's a little inside joke there, but uh, here's what it sounds like with the um, addition of this material that was added later. harmonic context is not yet clear. Um, it becomes clear in different ways at different points, but it's also um, highly mobile, and it depends on uh, how, what type of voice leading he's using um, as to where he wants you to go. But it often leaves it very um, unclear as to what's happening. 
Um, the last thing I, I'll show you before I perform the piece is that um, he originally had a different ending, uh, an entirely different ending, that just all it does is affirm D major like crazy. Um, so here's that. So in my opinion, and in lists I think as well, not the most compelling ending. So instead what he does is he goes back and uh, utilizes some of the earlier added material um, and also some of the introductory material for this movement um, as a way of closing it off. But he also does not end in D major. Uh, you'll hear how he ends it. And so I'll play this now. This is uh, uh, Istvan Sesenyi. at the end there, it's definitely not in, in D major. It's actually quite some, somewhere quite distant. Um, and what's also interesting about, and you can see this in the library's uh, uh, manuscript, is that Liszt puts in an indication for trumpets. So he's already thinking about orchestrating them at this time. Uh, he, does, uh, he doesn't end up, he puts in uh, instructions for Sessiony and Dayak but he doesn't end up doing the orchestration himself. Uh, a student of his named Arthur Friedheim also ended up doing, I think, four of the pieces. And I believe that Liszt heard those before he passed away the following year. Um, 
But I'm going to move on to the, um, the next piece, which is Franz Deak. And we do not have any source material for that particular piece at the library. Um, but you can hear, and I'll just point out a couple of things, and then I'll just play it. Uh, you can hear these fifths and sixths very clearly. You'll also hear the scale elements um, and also the barren octaves. There's also a, a kind of a secondary idea that I, I think of as like a modified arpeggio um, that ends up coming back in a big way at the very end of the piece, but I'll mention it again at that point. Um, so just, I'll just go ahead and play it and just listen for these very clear fifths and sixths uh, mode of ideas that are going to be there at the very beginning of the piece. that is quite being as unclouded as the commentator I, I first uh, read from in terms of where that piece goes. Uh, one might hear uh, what might be typically called Hungarian-ish sounding things because of the use of particular scales um, that particularly emphasize an augmented second um, to completely oversimplify it. Um, but then we move on to a new area that involves Moshonyi, Sessionyi, the first piece, and Teleki, um, who is the, uh, the third portrait is of that particular person. <clears throat> um, as mentioned earlier, uh, Sessionyi uh, committed suicide and uh, st stunned everybody. And Moshonyi, the story is within a few days, um, he wrote this uh, as a response. I'm not going to play the whole piece because it's a big piece, but I'm going to play a relevant little chunk. Um, and what I want you to particularly listen to is the bass line.
So in that baseline, we have uh, the seed for what uh, in 1885 Liszt would turn into his uh, Trauer Vorspiel and Trauer, uh, Trauer March. Um, and this, uh, the march in particular uses this um, base, and it's from this particular Trauer March, or rather funeral march, um, that he develops the Teleki portrait in the historical Hungarian portraits. Um, he makes certain modifications to it that you can see um, at, on our uh, manuscripts. So Liszt is modifying copyist manuscripts that we have. Um, but I want to show you how that Trauer Vorspiel leads into the march, and it helps to explain some of the changes that he made. Um, so here's the original uh, funeral prelude and march uh, that were for uh, August Gulerich, who ended up taking the, the historical Hungarian portraits to their next level. That's how he gets into it, and you might have noticed my little mistake there. That's because I was playing the version that Liszt uh, changed it to. Um, what we have is a very strange emphasis of C sharp, which is basically just the front and back end of the scale that is what the Trauer Prelude consists of. Um, I, I think I'm gonna skip this other de demonstration from uh, the Trauer March, because um, it's basically the same piece as Teleki, but it's just a bit longer. <clears throat> and the way that Liszt ended up tightening it up is by uh, extending the period that we have just an, uh, on the strong beat um, statement of that bass ostinato uh, pattern. Um, and then eventually, uh, it picks up steam and moves forward. It's just a little bit more tightly constructed than the um, than the other piece. Um, there is something that's really interesting in our manuscript that I just want to mention about, about here that is missing from the published version. And that's this uh, uh, amazing moment where he marks espressivo in the midst of a fortissimo passage. Um, and it's what's amazing about it to me, and it may just be me, is that um, that's how I would think of it when I got there, even though it's very, uh, dark and heavy. Um, the other thing that's, that stands as a difference between these pieces is that um, the funeral march version is all staccato, where there's a lot of piano in uh, the Teleki movement. 
So I'm just going to grab a sip of water, then I'll play the teleki movement. So one thing to notice at the very end of this is that we have isolated the fifth and the minor sixth within, the major sixth within this context sounds minor because of, uh, it sounds G minor-ish. Um, but this piece uh, precedes the other ones and it may well be the seed for identifying, identifying that as motivic uh, material for the rest of the entire work. Um, moving past Teleki, uh, we get to uh, 
Josef Jotvosch. Uh, you might know there's currently a living conductor and composer with that name. Um, I don't know if, if there's a relationship, but um, in any case, for our purposes, what we get here is more of those open fifths, and we get a very clear harmonic setting of the fifths and sixths. Um, here's what that fifths and sixths sound like here. So in this case, the outlines, fifths, sixths, and they'll be outlined more clearly when I actually play the piece. Um, let's see, do I have anything else about this? One other thing just to look for are there are also recurrences of these open scales and empty octaves, um, especially at the end of the first section. Um, so this is in uh, three sections, a very beautiful piece. So Liszt very carefully coordinated uh, these particular light cues uh, to happen during the course of that work, and it was just uh, pulled off brilliantly there. Um, but unfortunately, he didn't do that for the rest of the pieces. Um, well, or fortunately for me, hopefully for me. Um, the next piece, I'm gonna just keep moving right along, um, honors, uh, uh, Mihaly uh, Purushmarty, and he is a poet best known for um, his setting of the, the Hungarian Appeal, or sorry, his uh, penning of the Hungarian Appeal, which was then set by Egrishi um, uh, later and became something of a, of a national anthem. Um, and here's a case where I think that we have evidence in our collection of a different opening that should be there. Um, based on the fact that Liszt has crossed out, or actually covered up, and written on top of the published version. So uh, there's something uh, very interesting here. Here's the way it goes in the published version, and then when I actually play it, I'll play the, uh, uh, 
the new version that's based on the library's material. So what we have are very clear open fifths, fourths, um, very much in line with uh, the, that motivic continuity. Um, but Liszt ended up adding a scalar component to it, which I'll play in just a minute. Um, another important thing to point out about this particular piece is that it um, includes a quote from that Egreshi piece um, that in, Liszt even writes in, Furush Murti wrote this, uh, meaning that he penned the lyrics to it. Um, it's a little bit, uh, it's just a tiny fragment of the, of the theme. It actually comes from later in uh, the movements, or rather in the, the appeal. Uh, so it's not necessarily an obvious thing, um, except that the rhythmic material fe feels very familiar. Um, it also happens to have inversional relationships to that original appeal. It turns out that the library also has Liszt's piano version of this, the, the Sotsat und Garischer Hymnus, um, which is a combination of two pieces um, that it was originally for orchestra, and uh, uh, I think there were some singers involved too, and there's different versions of all these. And then uh, he made this solo piano version as well, which the library has. Um, there's that, and then there's one other thing I wanted to mention, which is that in all of these pieces, there are some real questionable tempos. And part of the issue is that um, you have copyists who will write in, for instance, quarter note equals 84 or something like that, and then you'll have uh, presumably list going in with a blue crown and putting it into cut time after the fact. Um, so it becomes a question of what exactly is the beat? Is it going to be the larger beat or is it going to be the smaller one? To me, the music makes it fairly clear that it is uh, the larger beat. So the music ends up going faster because of this. Um, otherwise, I feel it would just go too slow for what the material merits. Um, so here is uh, Furush Marji.
you can hear all those exposed octaves still very much around. Um, and the, another strange ending to the, to the work uh, in a very different place from what seemed like a B minor-ish or maybe B major-ish start to something in the G-ish region, but with, uh, without enough uh, pitches to make it very clear. Um, the penultimate work in this set, uh, the library has uh, a version uh, called Dem Andenken, Dem Andenken Petufis of that earlier piece from uh, about uh, 1877. Um, that list has corrected and made changes to. So he puts into there places where he wants a measure repeated twice or something like that. And then he gives a whole bunch of different endings. Um, and because of the way that he puts together these endings, which I'll play for you shortly, just so you can hear what the differences are. Um, it makes me think that um, the final version that got published is actually probably incorrect um, because of the particular profile and uh, character of the progression that he's using at the end. So I'll play my corrected version uh, for you. The uh, material itself, though, is related to Patofi, but in that um, it pulls from an earlier tradition uh, called the recitation, um, in which uh, you have a piano accompanying a dramatic reading of a work. And so in 1874, uh, Liszt did this with a Hungarian poem, uh, or story by uh, Yokai, I think I'm probably not pronouncing that right, um, which was ostensibly about Patofi, who again had been this major national hero who disappeared on the battlefield, uh, presumably dead, um, but nobody heard from him again. And actually, Yokai later wrote about what if he had lived that sort of a uh, alternate reality sort of scenario. Um, but what we have in this work that in the, in the, uh, basically translates to uh, um, the dead poet's love, um, you have the appearance of this very clear motto theme that gets associated with Patufi. I'm gonna play a little bit from that so you can hear that motto theme. Here it is in the original recitation. So you hear an extended version of that in De Mandink and Patufis. In fact, it starts with this, but up a half step. It starts that way with in De Mandink and Patufis. Um, later, Liszt would actually um, expand the opening. Um, in the Library of Congress expansion, it's by eight measures. In the version that um, got published that I think is probably correct, it's 10 measures. Um, correct because of that uh, double expository um, component that's present in most of, of Liszt's work um, that I mentioned before. There's also this other idea that comes into play um, that's kind of uh, an ethereal uh, type of music, and here's what that sounds like. So that will appear in the Patufi as well. Um, then Liszt does what you'd expect. He develops this idea, always presenting it in a motto type form. Um, but I just want to give you a couple of the examples of what, how he decides to set it, because he does not do that in Patufi, where he could have chosen to do it. Listen to what we have in the upper part. You're going to have those fifths and sixths.
very much moving into more of a, a Straussian kind of world. Um, and here are just two more quick examples. Lastly, a final development. I played it through till there because this idea is used very prominently in Patuffi, which I'll play now, um, but also in a very different way. So he simultaneously uh, expands the music and kind of redirects the dramatic content of the original recitation into this new uh, setting. But before I start, I forgot to mention that the, uh, the new endings, I should just show you quickly. So originally, at the end of Demon Denk and Patufis, it ends like this. The next version that List wrote, um, but then crossed out, goes like this. I'm playing a little bit faster than you would play it uh, normally. not happy with that, so he goes on, and some of this is illegible, so I'm just kind of filling in what I think is supposed to be there. Crosses that out. <laughs> Um, then he moves on to say, well, okay, I think I need to incorporate the Patufi motive. So he does this, and this is really hard to read, so I'm just kind of guessing. off there. So he's trying to think of a way to incorporate the melody, but it's not working. Um, so in the published version, what we have is this kind of a... That's the progression that gets put in there, but the chords are out of order. 
according to every single one of these other examples. And, uh, and in fact, the one that was not crossed out by list has a different uh, order. Um, and that is. And so that's the one I'm going to play. It's just two chords switched around, but it makes a big difference and it makes a little bit more sense from a voice leading perspective. Um, so here's Patufis.
So list solution ends up being uh, the most kind of exposed and like, uh, uh, but also the most poetic, I think, as a solution is just to set that motto theme by itself at the very end. Um, uh, and I think it's a very beautiful solution. Um, again, we end up in C sharp major and who knows where we came from, but uh, uh, it's a very kind of bold thing to do. Uh, we then move on to the last piece, which you might have heard before, uh, known in a version known as uh, Moshoni's Grabka Light, Moshoni's uh, funeral procession. Um, Moshoni, as I said, came into prominence uh, more or less af in the 18, late 1850s and into 1860s. The original his name was uh, Mikhail Brand, um, but he uh, decided to go by Moshoni um, to kind of show uh, solidarity with the Hungarian cause. Uh, so this particular one was written in 1870, so it's the, kind of the earliest of the set, um, and was List's response uh, uh, to uh, Moshoni's death. He was one of List's great uh, compositional friends. Um, so in addition just to being a great elegy, it serves as the capstone for this entire set of historical Hungarian portraits. Um, but what's interesting in particular about what I'm going to do today is that I'm going to play a version that shows corrections and additions in this hand uh, that came to us in the Ed Waters collection. Um, this is a, a, a very strange ending, but one that brings into play all the things I've been talking about with those fifths and sixths, open octaves, uh, scalar components, seconds moving uh, this way and that in a rhythmically clear fashion, um, but it was also something that List clearly struggled with. In fact, uh, I'll just play through a sped up version of a couple of those endings right now for you so you can hear uh, where he's starting with. It's supposed to end, or at least according to the original, in D major. Ultimately, he ends it in a very different way. And so I'm just gonna play through so you can hear it. And it's a, a striking difference. And I'm curious to see after we, if afterwards, if anybody wants to stick around and talk to me and look at the manuscripts, um, see what you think about it. And it's, I'm not sure that it's List's last word on it. It seems like it's certainly the last one that we have, um, but he was uh, prone to a lot of uh, revision and different versions of the pieces. So it would have been interesting to see what would have happened had this gone through the press. It might have made uh, other types of uh, differences too in the rest of the piece. So here is uh, Mihaly Moshoni.
So that's the way you've list edited it in this case. Um, so if, uh, thank you all for being here and uh, going through these with me. Um, I think there's a good reason to eventually have an edition made that incorporates uh, the library's manuscripts, and I think that uh, uh, that would be fantastic because I think some of the differences uh, make it tied tie it better together as a set and also just work uh, differently musically. Uh, List versions of his own pieces often have a separate identity. It's not necessarily a question of is one better than the other, um, but it's rather just a different way of looking at the same material. So it's always kind of an exciting thing to be able to look at this music and uh, learn from it. Uh, so thanks again for coming. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.